want to be overturned, uh, they're assigning a judge in the Southern District Court in New York. Um, and if we can move quickly, uh, hopefully we can get an injunction because this legislation is supposed to go into effect in March. Okay, so to correct that, the media, when I was reading from, uh, got that wrong. I, I, I guess they may have said class action because other reporters can join uh, if they have standing, or is that not the case? We, we, they haven't gone out. and uh, I mean, I, I think that mine is such a peculiar history uh, that they feel they don't really need. Got it. They don't need. I mean, there aren't many Americans who've spent the kind of time that I have with these groups. So um, they feel it's, you know, I'm pretty solid as a plaintiff. So they're not going and looking for other plaintiffs. So basically, you have the perfect standing as the former New York Times bureau chief over there. And, you know, as your job meeting with all these groups, uh, I mean, I, I would be genuinely concerned because they all you know, claimed at the time, the, the establishment did, uh, the authoritarian supporters that the Patriot Act wouldn't be used in non-terror related cases or on citizens. Now they admit it's used thousands of times right. a year per state, even at the state level. I mean, they're using all of this. Well, this is an important point. You know, when they passed the 2001 legislation, what we got was this sort of radical interpretation of it by uh, Bush's legal advisor, John Yu, and others. And that saw Jose Padilla, who is an American citizen, allegedly uh, was one of the hijackers who didn't make it on a plane, held for three and a half years by the military. Now, that is a, a, a situation that gets challenged legally, goes to the Supreme Court, and before the Supreme Court rules, Padilla is turned over to a civilian court. Um, the Supreme Court would not rule on it, rendering, uh, saying that, that it was now moot. Um, I think they, they just sort of, uh, it became a way for them not to wade into that controversy. We have Anwar al a Yemeni cleric, uh, and the executive branch, again, using that 2001 legislation, uh, serves as judge, jury, and executioner, uh, although he is a U.S. citizen, and orders his assassination. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it is, this essentially codifies into place, uh, legalizes this kind of activity. Um, and, and I think importantly, it frees the state up from going after groups uh, that, under the low, old legislation, you couldn't do this unless people were directly tied to Al Qaeda uh, or had some kind of tangential involvement in 9/11. Now you can go after groups that didn't even exist uh, in in uh, 2001. Uh, these so-called so associated forces. I mean, a lot of these groups in Yemen and Somalia weren't even around uh, in 9/11. So, yeah, it's 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 pretty serious. Well, it certainly is. Uh Look, there was a Liberty Dollar case. You probably didn't see it, but the Associated Press and uh, other uh, uh, publications wrote about it. And uh, Bernard von Nothaus had the Royal Hawaiian Mint and all these other uh, you know groups putting out commemorative coins. Well, he put out a Liberty Dollar, and in the uh, after conviction ruling for counterfeiting, the FBI and the U.S. Attorney said this guy's a domestic terrorist. He's a unique form of terrorism, and so we want the full 22 years uh, that he can get for this. So I more and more in cases also hear them use that terrorism term, and we see the military-industrial complex building up. We have no-fly lists that you can't find out how you get on the list or how you get off. Uh, all these you know, domestic spying agencies. Um, we've gotten the MIAC and Homeland Security reports that list gun owners, libertarians, anti-war activists as affiliated with terrorism. Uh, so, I mean, I see this being used across the board. I mean, even the senators involved that supported it said, you bet it affects citizens when there was a debate about that, the NDAA. Uh, you know, we kill the Lockheed, we'll kill citizens if we want. Uh, and, and then Lieberman said, we want to scare people. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen those creepy quotes. Yeah, the, it, it, well, there's no question if you read the legislation that this includes American citizens. And... Um, there's also no question that it's a it's a direct and and egregious violation of our constitutional rights. Now, the lawyers feel that uh, because of that, it has a pretty good chance of getting to the Supreme Court. But the court's so stacked with corporate stooges um, that um, you know we're not at all sure that that it's gonna uh, it's gonna get through the Supreme Court. That the Supreme Court will e will either hear it or um, uh, you know rule. Uh, in our favor. So, um, I mean, 
and I think it's still worth doing, and it's important. And you're right. I mean, look at what happened in the drug wars. I mean, uh, first they institute testing for prisoners, then they institute testing for people looking for jobs and people applying for welfare. I mean, it always creeps outward. You don't want to hand the state these kinds of powers. And if there is any kind of serious unrest, if the power elite feels threatened uh, from whatever, from popular movements, or this essentially allows them to call in the army. And I, you know, I don't know what the motives to the bill is. I mean, I do find it interesting that all of the intelligence agencies, the FBI, the CIA, the National Intelligence Agency, even the Attorney General's office were against this piece of legislation. The Pentagon was against it. So you have to ask, why does it pass? Why is it being pushed through? Uh, Robert Mueller, the head of the FBI, actually went up to, con to, to Congress and testified that passing this legislation would make the work of the FBI more difficult because it would be harder to get people to cooperate uh, if you extend these kinds of powers to the military, and yet it passes anyway. Uh, and I think the way the legislation is written, uh, it gives uh, a kind of iron bar uh, to those who want to crush internal dissent. Um, you know, maybe they don't trust the police finally for, to protect them. Uh, and this allows them to call in the U.S. military. Yeah, for those that haven't read the bill, it gets rid of posse comitatus. It, it, it also declares that they can basically kill anybody globally whenever they want, which I really see as a transference of war powers completely out of Congress into the office of the presidency. Right. And that was the battle between Carl Levin's office and the White House. It was never over the denial of due process. It was over the fact that Obama wanted these powers in his hands, uh, and uh, he wanted the ability to either target, uh, i.e. select, those who would be targeted or offer them exemptions. Uh, and he got it. That's what he got. But it was, there was never an argument at all. Dianne Feinstein actually proposed language that would have exempted American citizens, and both the Obama White House and the Democratic leadership turned it down. So we're talking about divine right of king type stuff, but generally even kings in ancient Europe and feudal times, as you know, uh, had to trump up something. This is just, we'll do whatever we want. But, but don't worry, Obama and Mitt Romney have both said, uh, you can trust us, we won't abuse this. Well, you know, he did. Obama issued a signing statement that said that it would not be used on American citizens. Well, that begs the question, then why didn't you put that in the legislation? Uh, the legislation does permit these kinds of draconian forms of control, stripping of legal rights to be carried out against U.S. citizens. So if it's not your intent to use it on American citizens, then you should have put that in the bill. You well, didn't well, Chris, that's what's that. even scarier. I want to get your view on this. Again, a Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, best-selling author, researcher, journalist, Chris Hedges is our guest. Why also the exercise of deception? I mean, early on two months ago, it doesn't affect citizens, and it has that deceptive uh, language where it says you're exempt, except this section says you're not. And then they deny it affects citizens for a while. Then the White House says they're against it. Then they blame Carl Levin. He says, hey, you told us to do this. And then after it passes, uh, we see this victory lap by uh, Graham and others of the senators saying you bet it affects citizens, almost like a weird celebration at, with hopping up and down uh, by some of the senators. I mean, this is this is like a science fiction movie with caricatures of bad guys. Well, because it's like Obamacare. They figure no one's going to read it. Uh, actually, this is quite readable. You can pull it up on the web. It's not that long. Obamacare is 2,000 pages of corporate malfeasance. Um, so uh, they're just assuming that people won't read the legislation, and, and they spin it. They, they, but, you know, it's completely disingenuous, and that's a very kind word to use uh, about the Obama White House and their characterization of what this bill does. I mean, it's pretty clear. You don't have to, be, you don't have to go to Harvard Law School to figure out, figure out what they're saying. I want to talk more about your case and, and so many other issues in limited time we have with you, but uh, separately, you probably haven't heard it because it just happened yesterday. We played the clip in the last hour. Rush Limbaugh has come out and said basically that Ron Paul, Rand Paul, who both complained about being detained and harassed by TSA and groped, uh, that they sound like Islamic terrorists and deserve, uh, and I'm reading quotes here, you know, that the TSA needed to do this. And so now we're even starting to hear, well, Ron Paul doesn't want a war with Iran. He's with the terrorists. doesn't matter if, as you mentioned, most of the experts in the CIA and the government say don't have a war, uh, it doesn't matter if if uh, 
the whole TSA thing is blatantly unconstitutional. We're now even hearing kind of the neocon mouthpieces more and more talk about public figures as being terrorists. Well, I hadn't heard that. I mean, there's a reason corporate sponsors pay him for, what does he earn, $4 million a year? I, I, I think it's more like $15 million a year. Is it really? Yeah, he, he's got a $100 million contract, yeah. Is he really? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, let, let's follow the money. I mean, who does he work for, who pays him, and why does he say it? And, what, you know, why is he why is he getting that much money? Uh, the rest of us don't get that much money. What is your view of uh, Ron Paul overall uh, on the whole war issue? Because the corporate media tries to act like he's crazy, but, uh, I mean, the, the former head of the Mossad agrees with him. The last two chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff agree with him on Iran. I mean, most of the experts agree with him, but then there's this hoax that people that don't want a bunch of new wars are the bad guys. No, on the issue of the wars, I'm totally in agreement with Ron Paul, and I speak as somebody who spent a lot of time in Iran. And, of course, a lot of time in the region. Uh, the uh, An assault on Iran would just be catastrophic. It would trigger a regional war, not to mention uh, thousands and thousands of dead, because most of these facilities are built in highly dense or densely populated areas. So uh, it would trigger a kind of war of Shiism. Remember, Iraq is 60 percent Shia. Uh, no, it's just, uh, yeah. So on the issues of the war, I think... Uh, and not only the war, but the issue of internal uh, activity by the security and surveillance state. I think Ron Paul is one of the few voices, I don't know if he's in the mainstream, but you know, at least he can get up on the debates. He's one of the very few voices that, uh, that is speaking out. Uh, getting back specifically to your lawsuit, uh, what's the timetable on this? When will we know? And what is your uh, lawsuit basically declaring? It's asking that the, the the law be annulled because it's unconstitutional, that we're not asking for anything else. Uh, now, if uh, they've assigned a judge, we're trying to find out who it is. Um, if, you know, we know the records of the judges, which are actually not bad on civil liberties in the Southern District Court, uh, and, and if they feel that the judge is open uh, to hearing this case, they'll push for lit litigation before March so that they can delay uh, the uh, law. They can have the, have the law essentially put in abeyance until the case is heard, which uh, uh, that, that, that is the, the current tactic. Chris, going back to uh, why the system is doing this, I've got another angle I want you to comment on and get your take on. I have seen this NDAA and the SOPA bill and all of this wake people up who were asleep like nothing I've ever seen before. I mean, I'd say the response is 10, 15 times what the Patriot Act was. A, are you seeing it wake people up? And B, why do you think it's wake, uh, starting to wake people up? Well, I think, you know, there there's all sorts of intrusions into our life uh, that are no longer theoretical. Um, the passage of the, of the FISA reform bill, uh, in essence, makes legal what under our Constitution has traditionally been illegal and does so retroactively. Uh, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of tens of millions of Americans. Uh, the SOPA bill, as you pointed out. I mean, I think it's just too hard to ignore. Uh, my understanding is that the poll, the polling on the NDAA is that only between 2 and 9 percent of the American public supports it. This has no public support. The FISA Reform Act didn't have any public support either. Um, there are powerful corporate forces that want to ram it through. Uh, because it protects them and, and this narrow oligarchic elite, uh, but but it it's left a really bad taste in the mouths of the vast majority.